In Manhattan, all monsters are proximate, if not by geography, then by imagination. And the contours of the imagination are changed by money. The units of luxury get larger. And this lawyer, this man, my own man, this hairless ape in a size 44 suit knows it. You eat what you kill, he tells himself. Kill more and you'll eat more. Another child means a new apartment, a bigger car, and keeping Selma, their babysitter, on for another few years. He's paying Selma $48,000 a year. When you figure in the extras and freebies and vacations, that's $100,000 pre-tax, more than he made as a first-year lawyer. How amazing he can pay this. How terrible that he must. And Judith is expecting a big shingled summer place on Nantucket someday, just like her friends have. Fifteen rooms, tennis court, heated gunite pool, koi pond. You'll do it, I know you will, she says brightly. He nods in dull acceptance at the years of work necessary. He'll be humpbacked with fatigue. Yes, money. He needs more money. He's making a ton, needs more. The law firm's compensation committee is run by a tight-fisted bean counter named Larry Kermer. Our lawyer, a sophisticated man who made the review at Yale, has enjoyed fantasies of savagely beating Kermer. These scenarios are quite pleasurable for him to indulge, and such indulgence results in his ability to appear cheerful and positive when in Kermer's company. Kermer has no idea of the imaginary wounds he's received, the eye gougings, drop kicks to the groin. But if Kermer doubled his salary, the fantasies of violence and retribution would disappear. Life would be kinda great. Now our man steps toward the apartment house, admiring the cherry trees under the windows, just past their peak, as is our man himself. Passers-by at this late hour noticed nothing unusual about him. If he was once sleekly handsome, he is no longer. If he had once been a vigorous twenty-year-old, now he is paunched in the gut, a man who tosses a rubber football to his son Timothy on weekends. A man whose wife apparently does not mind that when he suggests that they have sex, he uses mock witty metaphors involving speedboats, get up on my water skis, or professional basketball, drive the lane. Yes, apparently Judith likes his conventional masculinity. It does not cause any rearrangements of her femininity. It is part of Judith's life, her lifestyle, to be honest, which is not quite the same as a sofa or a minivan, but not utterly divisible from them either. This is the way she prefers it, too. And any danger to their marriage will come not from a challenge to its conventionality, some rogue element, some dark and potent night, but from her husband's sudden inability to sustain the marriage's predictable comfort. He, for his part, doesn't yet understand such things, which is to say he doesn't really understand his wife. He understands his law firm and his son and the sports page. He is, in fact, very similar to a sofa or a minivan. He has never lost or gained very much, just dense and unidentified stains. His griefs are thus far minor, his risks utterly safe, his passions unremarkable, his accomplishments incremental and, when measured against his enormous advantages of class and race and sex, more or less obligatory. If he has the capacity for deep astonishment or genuine brutality, it is as yet undiscovered. Am I too hard on him? Is my description cruel and dismissive? Probably. He was, after all, handsome enough, quite well thought of, dependable in word and deed, a real workhorse in the office, a heck of a guy, right as rain, a straight shooter, a good dude. His waist really wasn't one Sunday times too thick. He was even reasonably fit. But I am allowed to distort this man to seek indications of weakness and decay because it makes his fate easier to explain. And because that man, you know this already, that man was me, Bill Wyeth. I'd been away for four days. My boy was turning eight, and he and his friends were set to go bowling, attend a Knicks practice, and eat at a midtown restaurant featuring waiters dressed like aliens. Then they'd all sleep over at our apartment that night. And as I opened the door, the signs of their wolf pack activity met me in the hall. 
a dozen odd sport shoes scattered over the floor, a spray of coats and hats, a pile of gift bags. Judith, I concluded, had corralled the boys into bed, then skipped cleaning up after them. A shadowed glimpse into our bedroom confirmed my guess. There Judith lay, exhausted in her sleep, her breasts rising and falling. I gently closed the door and peered into our son's bedroom, where all nine boys lay huddled and overlapping in their sleeping bags like puppies. I drifted into our new kitchen, which had cost almost $100,000. On the new kitchen counter lay a list, typed by my secretary of each boy's full name, their parents and or step-parents and or nannies, and the numbers of each. Here were the sons of some of the most prominent 40-ish fathers in the city, or in the case of several second marriages, 50-ish fathers, and likely as not, their equally prominent mothers. Every day their corporations and banks appeared in the global financial press. Citibank, Pfizer, IBM. Certain boys in our son's class were favorites of his, others not. But the favorites didn't correspond perfectly with the boys in the class whose parents might be cultivated. Perhaps I had suggested a few certain other boys be invited for fairness. Perhaps? Of course I had. 